without further ado, before I introduce our amazing guest speaker, just to give you all a little bit of background, a brief background about the Bruin Sports Business Association. So myself and another student at UCLA just helped create it pretty recently. So we're a new organization here at UCLA. And our mission was to not only bridge the gap between students and student athletes here at UCLA, but also just to create a space for people who are like-minded, who are driven and passionate about the sports industry. And so one thing at UCLA, we are, once again, the number one public university in the world. Um, and one thing that we don't necessarily have is sports directly related majors. So that is one thing we created with in mind for creating this business uh, association at UCLA was to be able to bring this space so that students and student athletes alike can learn from powerful figures, people who have experience in the sports industry uh, and can learn that as they get ready to navigate that space themselves. So that's a little bit of background about the Sports Business Association. Once again, I'm the president. I'll be moderating today. And we're super excited to have you all, whether you're a student, alumni, family and friends, we're super excited to have you. So without further ado, last time, uh, our guest speaker today is the Martin Jarmond. And I'll go ahead and start off um, just to give you guys a little bit of the agenda of what today is going to look like. So I'm going to do a, a brief introduction of our guest. We'll have Martin kind of share his story a little bit of how he got to UCLA, where he is now, and his plans for the future. I'll also start to lead a discussion based on questions that uh, our BISBA executive board created. And then in the last 15 minutes or so, I'll also open it up to the entire audience, all of you guys. So if you guys do have questions that come up throughout, don't be shy. Just the one thing I ask of you is to please use the raise hand function or at any moment, feel free to just type the questions in the chat. So look forward to all the questions that you guys may have. Um, and at the end, I'll conclude us out um, and talk about our next play. So now just to give the formal and brief introduction. Who is Martin? So today we have our guest speaker, Martin Jarman, the Alice and Nahum Laner Family Director of Athletics at UCLA, aka our UCLA Athletic Director. Uh, in the 2000s, he was the former D1 basketball player, actually, at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and there he was a two-year captain, and he led his team to the first ever NCAA tournament appearance in 2000. By 2001, he graduated from there with the Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies, and shortly after that, he earned his Master's in Business Administration and a Master's in Sports Administration at Ohio University. Shortly following that, he became the Assistant Athletic Director of Development at Michigan State University, then hopped over and became the Chief of Staff and Deputy Director of Athletics at Ohio State University, um, and was a lead administrator for football and basketball there as well. Then it, uh, briefly, he was also, in 2017, he became the youngest Power Five Athletic Director at Boston College. Um, and that was at age 37. And he was also the first black athletic director there as well. Now to the present, he is now the UCLA athletic director. What a lot of athletes, I think he's a, a Westwood hero for the UCLA, Nike and Jordan deal and so much more. And yes, if you look over to the right hand side, screenshot it if you would like these are the pictures of him back in his playing days as well um so just a little I bit took a screenshot of that that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> so definitely Ooh. screenshot that if you want um but we had to throw in a little throwback for <laughs> so without further ado martin thank you so much i'm going to stop screen sharing so you can see everyone and kind of take us through take us through your journey to you know i briefly mentioned your your history and background, but take us really through a journey of uh, who Martin was as he came to UCLA. So uh, I wanna say welcome and thank you for having me. Um, and Christina, thanks for, for getting this and pulling this together. Um, I don't know if I would have done this or committed to it if it wasn't for you and your connection and kind of interacting with you already as a leader among our student athletes. Um, and I love, I love being engaged with you guys. I mean, that's, that's really important. I see Bo right here. What's up, Bo? I, I see, uh, you know, I, I can't go through right now. I gotta stay focused. But anyway, um, to all the student athletes on here, I appreciate you coming on. Um, so I'll say briefly, I, I, I like more questions. I think that's the best 
conversation. This is for you. Um, I assume most of your students, are there any, are there any alumni in here also? Oh yeah, alum 2019, there we go, okay. Um, Shout out Chloe, I see you in there. Okay, all right, yeah. Okay, Jack from the Inlay Empire, there we go. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so this is for you, you know, so if you have questions or thoughts or, you know, whatever, I think the best conversations, at least that I'm a part of with Zooms are when it's very engaging, very interactive. I know we're gonna do with the board Q and A, but also if you have something um, I'm not looking at the chat, but Christina or somebody can maybe maybe catch that. And if it's something good, uh, we'll hit it. Uh, so, so anyway, yeah, I'll just briefly say, um, what a time to be alive. Uh, you take a new job, you come to Westwood, you move 3,000 miles. I came from Boston um, during a pandemic, and I've never eaten inside a restaurant in LA since I've moved here in September. How about that? Think about that. I've been here since September and never once have I eaten inside of a restaurant yet. It's crazy, right? So just imagine you move to a new community, a new place, and uh, places just aren't open, you know? Um, and then the other piece uh, that's, that's really interesting is um, I'm a big connection person. I think energy and connection are two of the most important things, not only in sports, but in business and life. Connectivity and energy, right? Think about the teams, the best teams you played on, you were connected and you had great energy, right? Like you were one to be around each other or think about even not even teams, think about groups or for, for those non-athletes, uh, whether it's a group project, whether it's something you did with, with other people, right? The best ones, you had that connectivity, you had energy. So that's what I'm about. And I think that's really important. Uh, and that's what makes it so hard right now because we're not able to connect in a way that we normally would. You know, um, I have head coaches that I still haven't met yet. I met Chris Waller, the gymnastics coach in person for the first time last week. You know, that's just how crazy things are. But no matter what, in, in chaos, you've got to find the calm and, and you've got to find a normalcy. And that's really important. That's what I've tried to do kind of with, with the routine with finding um, hope and optimism, you got to be positive. You can't you can't let everything happen and bring you down. Uh, they're going to have moments where you do, but I think it's really important to get back on that positive train because um, you're going to get eaten alive if you're not. You got to have energy. You got to have juice. You got to like let's go. You know, I want to be around people that that have juice, that have energy. Uh, that's really important, especially in sports. You know, it's it's really competitive. You know, it's it's a game of inches. Um, and so you gotta, you gotta focus on the detail. You gotta get in the weeds and you gotta grind it out. And that's kind of my mentality coming to Westwood is we gotta grind it out. We got a lot of work we gotta do. You gotta have that energy, that focus, that drive. Um, and that's hopefully what, what, what I have and what you'll see from me. Um, uh, but, but I'm excited to be here and, um, I'll shut up right now, Christina. Is that is that is that good? You know, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm getting yeah, ready right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting that jab, that left jab, that right cross. I'm you brought, you brought right the now. energy. You brought the energy, and so yeah, uh, I, I definitely can. I can start us out. I can start us out with the executive board uh, that had some questions uh, prepared. So we'll start off with the softball. We'll start off with the with the. We'll ease you in. So first question for you: You're talking about energy and having this kind of like commitment to the game, maybe that drive around sports. So what at what moment did you realize you have that background in sports but at what moment did you realize you know that you might want to become an athletic director was there one moment or did you always just want to work in sports you know i that's a great question i did not know i wanted to be an athletic director probably until even when i was at michigan state i was at michigan state for seven years oh three i i, I probably towards the end of my time at michigan state it was kind of like do I want to? But I really still didn't know until I got to Ohio State and I got under um, the athletic director at Ohio State, Gene Smith. And, and, you know, I saw him. I saw someone that was like me. He played college football at Notre Dame. He's from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Humble beginnings. And now he's, he, he's black and he's an athletic director. And so I think it's really important that you got to see people that look like you doing what you want to do. I think that is really important. And, and remember that there comes a point in time in your career. And, and I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate that it happened for me at Michigan state. I had a boss that kind of told me like, Hey, bro, I can't do much more for you. You've grown here. You've learned, 
you need to get under somebody. Uh, and he actually said like a Gene Smith, somebody that can really teach you and kind of help you get to the next level of growth and, and understanding and learning. And that was important, but even more important is I saw somebody that looked like me doing something that I was like, man, that's kind of cool. Like, like he's making decisions, he's making happen, right? Like I, I want to be in the room when it happens, right? Like I that's that that's important to me. Um, but but I will tell you, going back to undergrad, I played college basketball. I always like being on a college campus. Like, you know how you go walking in between classes. I go to we call it the Hawks and S. I don't know where on campus we like eat, not the cafeteria, but kind of like where Chick fil A and stuff like that would be. Mm -hmm. uh, Ackerman. There we go. Yeah, Thanks, Colin. Ackerman. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that. But so, like, I remember I, could, I would go and see like my math professors playing cards. And I was like, damn, that's cool. Like, they teach and then they also play cards. Or you see some professors like playing basketball um, at the rec center. I just, I just always love the energy of a college campus. So I will say when I played, there were two things. One, I had a great experience. And so that probably won, that probably innately, I felt like I wanted to help other people have a great experience. And I didn't play a lot. I thought I should have played more than I did. So like, I didn't want to be a coach because of that. I didn't want to be the one to recruit a kid and then they don't play or their experience is not what they envision it to be. So that's why I didn't really want to coach because I'm like, that, that's, not, that's not me. And then the second thing, I just love the energy of a college campus. So I thought when I graduated, like, I don't know what I want to do. I might want to be a college professor. I might, but I, but I was like, I'd love to work on a college campus. I really like the idea of like working on college campus. So um, did I answer your question, Christina? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you did. You did. You did. Um, okay. So going off of that. Um, you guys can't see the UCLA right there, right? I keep worrying about it. You got it. You got the UCLA. Now I'm a, now I'm a loosen up now because you can't see it like that. It's all right, about the brand right. and the narrative. I think about that. Like I need the UCLA to be up there. You got it. You got to keep it up. Got to keep it up. Um, so I have a question about you came in last year at probably the craziest time. <laughs> uh, like actually yes. the craziest time. Actually the craziest time. <laughs> so I already know from an athlete perspective, we always talk about compartmentalization. Right. I know mm -hmm. my dad always taught me that as an athlete. And I think just as a student here to be able to thrive, you have to be able to compartmentalize, prioritize and execute. So but you came in mid pandemic, COVID, world crisis, uh, racial climate, crisis. social justice. Yeah, everything. And then on top of all of that, uh, we had a lawsuit with Under Armour. So I just want to know how difficult was that transition for you into UCLA last summer and spring? And how did you compartmentalize and prioritize throughout all of that? That's a great question. So I'm going to try to answer it very directly. First, I'll say that uh, the company you mentioned, I don't mention them by name. Uh, we are in a, a lawsuit with them. So I've got to be careful with my word usage. Um, but yeah, it was a crazy time. Uh, probably it was, it was a week to 10 days when we received a letter from such company that said we're out. And I remember Dan Guerrero, the former AD called me, I was in Boston and he said like, Hey, <laughs> I need to talk to you about something. And it was like, what, you know? And, um, and then, uh, skip to a few weeks later, might've been, it might have been two or three weeks later. Um, and, and also, too, before I even started, I kind of got called in. You know, the, the George Floyd situation happened. Tragic. Uh, I had not started yet, but I knew that was important. That was a moment where I, I wanted to show you got like our student athletes in the UCLA community. Like, I understand that this is really a big deal and really important. And I need to hear how our student athletes are feeling. So I, I called a couple uh, student athletes and 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 that kind of kind of got my mind thinking about you know how do we make change how do we have impact vote but before you can vote you got to understand before you understand you got to register you can't make impact without so that's how voter registration came is talking to a couple student athletes at UCLA and at Boston College um, and, and so that was even while I was in Boston so I kind of got just thrown in and uh, how do you compartmentalize? That's a great question. Um, when, when there's chaos, right? Just 
you got to find something that's like, this is my phone. You got to find something that you can like lock in on and stay right there. That's, that's really important in this focus. And so for me, when everything around you is so unpredictable, you have to create things and focus on what is predictable. What's predictable? Myself, my thoughts. Am I going to focus on that former company that dropped us and what the hell I'm going to do? Or am I going to get real focused and go in and say, you know what? This is an opportunity because you know what? We don't need to be with them anyhow. And I'm going to try to find who's the best, that's got the best gear, that's elite, that's innovative. This is an opportunity. Is it going to hurt financially? Absolutely. But you know what? Without struggle, there's no progress. You got to go through it sometimes. And so for me, I compartmentalize by, by focusing, trying to be consistent. And that starts with you. So, so my workouts, for example, you know, I, I'm a go to the gym guy a couple times a week. Gyms are closed. So I was kind of sporadic with working out or doing some push-ups. Or I said, nah, bro, you got to get to consistency. So I started running like four days a week. So like, boom, I know it mentally. That's when I listen to my podcast. Get your mind right. I got a big thing um, that you'll hear me say. You guys will hear me say a lot. Mind right, game right. Because your game can't be right, guys, unless your mind is. It starts right here. You win or lose right here. And that's not just sports. That's life, in my opinion. So mind right, game right, what does that mean? That means whatever you got to do, when the lights are bright, you got to perform. Whether that's a test you're about to take, whether that's a game in the Rose Bowl, whether that's that track meet, whatever it is, whether it's a class project, when the lights are bright, the best perform. You have to. There's no other way to look, look at it. And so for me, that game, though, can't be right unless your sleep is right, your nutrition is right, your, your working out, your, your mind. Like, what's your frame of mind? How you think? You know, if I came in and was like, oh, there's so many issues here. I didn't, I didn't realize this during my interview. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. If I, if I focused on that, right, that's going to manifest. That's going to manifest. If I'm like, you know what? I'm at UCLA. We just need a little bit of shining off. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need a little more grit, a little more perseverance, a little more energy. Like, let's go, let's go, let's go. We all right. You know, and then you start thinking that, you start saying that, and then you get people around you start believing in that. You know, that's, that's big. Mind right, game right. Because at the end of the day, as an athletic director, and I truly believe this, as an athletic director, you're only selling two things. When I say selling, as AD, you sell a lot. You, you do donor events. You do season ticket holders. You're trying to convince somebody to, to come to an event, uh, to invest in your program. You're always selling. In every business, you sell, right? And for me, I look at it as either I'm selling hope or I'm selling winning. That's the only two things I'm selling. I'm selling one or the other. We may have one program that, that's winning championships left and right. You're selling winning. Look. Be a part of this. This is a winning program. Let's go. Or you might, or you might have a program that's not quite there. But what can we do to create that energy, that positivity to say, you better get on right now. You better get on right now because that's hope. That's this is going somewhere. You got 25 programs. You're going to have programs that fit both of those. Right. But that's what I'm selling. So how do I do that? You compartmentalize. You focus your energy on obviously the things you can control. But I really think you got to stay up. What helps you stay up and in your best frame of mind? You know, like that's really important. Mind right, game right. I love that. Mind right, game right. And just always being mindful of what's helping you stay up, what's giving you the energy so that you can stay positive, stay forward, keep pushing everything forward. Um, and know so thyself. You got to know thyself. For me, for example, I'll just, I'm sorry, Christine, but I want to say this. You have got to stop doing or limit the things that don't help you feel good you know if i get into something you know one of the things i'll give you an example i mean you lose a football game if i went on twitter and looked at my mentions my wife i mean i'm gonna be in like a, a pissy mood the whole night and the next day and i used to at boston college as a young ad i did that i'd look at it uh, you know and and then you'd be at the gym the next day and it could be 10 positive things. It's that one negative that stays with you, that stays with you. So then I had to make a decision. I got to have discipline. I can't look at it because it doesn't put me in the right frame of mind. These people don't know 
They don't understand how hard it is to win. They don't understand what goes into it. They have no clue. But you know what? That's not their job to have a clue. It's my job to have the discipline and the focus to not do the things that don't make me feel good, do the things that do. And so you got to know yourself also in a time of chaos. What helps me? What fuels my mind? What takes away from it? Your friends, negative energy, like all of that, you got to know yourself too. And I'll stop. Yeah, no, no, that's great. And I think it's funny because I think a lot of people on the call probably uh, was prepared to hear just some career advice, just hear about your experience there and you're getting a motivational speaker all in one. So no. definitely with you. We're following you. We're following you. Yeah, I'm fired up too. You damn right I'm fired up. You should be fired up. <laughs> So going off of that, so now we're all, I think we're all on the same page. We're going to start to remove the negatives out of our life, right? Uh, one of the, the books I started reading for my, my grad class actually last quarter was the, the seven uh, or highly, or the seven habits of highly seven. Yep. people, right? Uh, Stephen Covey. And so one of the things he talks about is constantly sharpening the saw. So for you personally, you know, you remove the negatives out of your life or the things that suck out that energy from you. But for you, what sharpens your saw? Is it books, podcasts, family, friends, mentors? What is it for you that gives you that energy and gives you kind of that, that mindset to keep pushing forward and show up as your best self? It starts with me. It starts with the voice in my head. So I, I am very mindful when, I'm, when I go zero dark 30 and I'm like, Ugh, Jay, relax, bruh. Hey, it's not Rome won't, won't build in a day one thing at a time. However you feel, if I'm down, if you feel this way now, it's temporary. Never get too high, never get too low. It's never as good as it seems. It's never as bad as it seems. So it starts with me and the voice that what I tell myself. That's, the, that's one of the biggest things I can tell you is you've got to learn ways to manipulate the voice in your head. We have all had coaches in our life. You know, the, the coach that stays with you, that's been with you the longest, yourself. You're your own coach. You know what I'm saying? So, so think about that. Like, why would you tell yourself stuff that if you were coaching somebody, you wouldn't tell that person? You know, like, man, you're, you're no good. You wouldn't tell that to, to somebody that was on a team of yours, right? That you were coaching. Why are you going to say that to yourself? Oh, I ate something. Oh, why did I do that? You know, that guilt when you eat ice cream or whatever you do. My, that's part of mine. You know, it's like, oh, but now I'm easier on myself. Like, be gentle with yourself. Like, you're human. Like, it's okay. So it starts with me in the voice in my, in my head and what I tell myself. And I'm a very positive person by nature. So I try to, like, I, I just, just feed myself with that. Um, and they don't it's, it's working out. I, I'm a big movement person. You got to move every day. Even if it's just walking, you need to move. And we are fortunate in California here. Man, it's sunny every day. Like, if you were in the Midwest where I was before, Northeast, it's like a lot of gray days and you're like, Man, it's beautiful out. So you gotta, you gotta. For me, it's movement and, and energy. That that just helps me get going. Um, my workouts, again, that's really important. I can't miss those, especially when I'm getting more stressed. You know, um, that that helps me. Prime example, uh, quick quick example. During the football season, we were supposed to play Utah, and um, and this was like a Thursday. No, Friday. Friday's the day it changed. And I remember mid morning that, that, that whole, I went to football practice in the morning, we're gonna play Utah. And then mid morning, I got a tip from somebody that said like, hey man, I'm here in Utah's having some problems. And I'm like, what? And this is like 1030 or something. So long story short, I'm calling the conference. I'm, I'm trying to make moves and get the Pac-12, like get off your butt. Like we gotta start talking about this in case this happens. And it got so stressful at some point that I, I had to stop and I told the pack, I was like, look, I'll call y'all back in 20 minutes. And I literally ran, I had to go run. I had to just think, clear my mind, run. And then as I'm running, I'm like, you know what? The most important thing is we have got to get a game this weekend. These guys have practiced too hard, worked too hard to not get a damn game. Like, so then it helped me focus and center. And I came back and I literally did a lot of the dealings while I'm like jogging and I stopped to walk. So again, that's knowing yourself, though. I knew that was going to help me focus the way that I need to focus to not get caught up in Pasadena and L.A. County and this and that. Get a game, bro. What do you need to do? Who, who's out there? OK, you're not playing cow. cow go, you know, boom, boom, boom. So um, so anyway, your workouts, your, the voice, the coaching yourself. That's really big. Um, 
what else gives me energy? Family. Like I, I have a, a one-year-old, like sometimes in between Zooms or whatever, when I just, I'm just tired, like I'll hold her, I'll go grab her or something. Cause that just gives me some juice. That gives me some energy sometimes. Um, that's important. And, uh, Podcasts. I listen to podcasts a lot. Again, it's, it's what you feed your, your mind. You know, when I was younger, I probably would run or work out listening to music all the time. Now I listen to more podcasts. Uh, I think that's really important. Do you have a specific favorite podcast, favorite book, anything you want to, we're all listening. We're all ready to hear the names. Do you have one? Uh, you know, there's, there's a couple out there. Um, I try to learn. I try to listen to different things. Because as an AD, your job is so all consuming that I like to hear about technology. I like to hear about entrepreneurship. So like I listen to Pivot. That's a, that's a podcast I listen to. Um, JJ Reddick, Old Man in the Three. Um, that's with NBA, but also he has a leadership series. He had Bob Iger on a few weeks ago. That's a good one. If you listen to Old Man in the Three, find a Bob Iger one. He's a former CEO of Disney. He talks about just kind of what made the decision making behind buying Marvel Universe or Pixar or how he came up as an intern through Disney to like CEO. Like that was a real good one, right? Um, because you can always get little nuggets and tidbits. So I say, uh, I say those are two that, that, um, that come off the mind, but I listen to uh, Fresh Air, NPR Fresh Air. Um, this is stuff y'all wouldn't care about, though. When I was your age, I would, I would listen to NPR Fresh Air, man. I'd be like, man, Fresh Air, what the, what the hell are you talking about, man? Fresh Air. You know, so. <laughs> you know, that's funny. I think some of us might check it out. You know what I mean? We're trying to be like you. And so one thing um, kind of going on. Be better off, than me. Don't be like me. Be better than me. <laughs> be better. Always striving to be better. Um, I have a question. So I think everyone on this call can agree UCLA is the best school in the nation across uh, academics, athletics, everything. All together, it's the full package. So for you with experience at all these different schools and now here at UCLA, even with such unprecedented times, what is your favorite thing about UCLA or the Bruin family? Well, I'm going to have an asterisk by this answer because a lot of things I haven't experienced. Like, like I've heard that Bruin Walk is really cool when students are on campus. You know, I don't, there's no, you know, I don't know what that feels like, you know. Uh, so, so, so there's so many things that I'm sure that I will learn and, and get to do or experience that I'll appreciate. So you just got to remember from my time being here in, in uh, September to now, um, probably best thing I like about UCLA. Is that the question? Best thing I yeah. like? Yeah. You know, I would say the people, you know, whether it's student athletes or whether it's like faculty or vice chancellors at UCLA, you recognize quickly you're around elite talent. Like people are really talented. And that's not the case everywhere you go because UCLA is a desirable place. So it attracts the best and like iron sharpens iron. You get better when you're, when I'm talking to the vice chancellor of communications and we're, we're trying to figure out like we are now with a statement. And I'm like, you know, I think I should get interviewed and I think I should be straight up and say this. And she, she said to me, no, you know what? You weren't here last year. Why are you going to answer questions about last year's budget, for example, when you weren't here? And then that's on, yeah, you know what? I didn't think about that. For me, I was just trying to be transparent and, and be the front person. Well, sometimes you got to take a step back. Sometimes you don't need to be the front person and you let the statement or whatever it is speak for itself. You don't get that everywhere. You know, she made me better by the way she challenged what I was saying and thinking to do and it made me shift. So I think the best thing I like about UCLA is the people, meaning you're, you're just around talent, man. Like it's, it's just really talented people. And that to me, that makes you better. Like it, it depends on how you look at it. You know, you can compete, but you also you know, push me to be better. You know, we've, we've had meetings where Christina, you were on and I, and I met with, um, you know, some black student athletes, for example, and it, it pushed me a little bit. Like I, I made an example of like, you know, when you're black, um, I've had my former boss tell me to cut my hair before I go on a job interview and I cut it. And then I had somebody say like, nah, man, I, 
Mr. Jordan, we ain't cutting my, I ain't cutting my hair. Like that ain't me. And I'm like, no, young blood, you need to cut your hair, blah, blah, blah. And then it made me sit back and be like, man, am I, am I missing it? And I started listening and it's like, no, we both got a perspective. And so I need to learn from you just like you need to learn from me. And I love that kind of like environment. That's talent. That's people that are bright, that are talented. So that's what I like about it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I think that shows just like uh, the adaptive leadership, just like a constant evolution of your mindset growth, that growth mindset too. And also just having the humility to kind of look back and reflect at yourself too, you know, and being able to grow from every situation there. So I'm gonna ask one more question that the e-board helped prepare and the, the audience and all of you guys, if you guys have questions, now you guys can put it in the chat or use the raise hand feature and, and I'll toss it off um, to you guys as well. So my last question from the e-board, we have to talk about the Nike. Jordan and Nike, I knew you were gonna say it. Of course we have to, you know, I've been here so long. I was here when we had Adidas and we were banging our coaches, banging our coaches aside with Nike. I gotta something. take this off for this. You're getting me all hot right now. You know what I'm saying? I gotta get, I gotta, I'm getting hot right now, man. I'm getting upset. You know what I'm saying? Do what like that? Why you? Never mind. Let me stop. Sorry. So we were, um, yeah, I've been here for some time. So, you know, I was here with the Adidas. We were begging our coaches, trying to get some Nike and, and Jordan. I was here with insert name company here as well, as we all were, as we we're finishing out that contract and begging our coaches, Nike, Jordan, never thought it could happen. And all of a sudden, and now it happened. So for you, you know, I, I saw the article talking about how you started listening to the athletes, what the athletes wanted at this time. So can you talk a little bit about that and what contributed to you actually kind of going through and, and trying to secure this Nike and Jordan deal? Yeah. So by the way, this could be a two hour podcast on, or an interview on this, how Nike and Jordan and UCLA came together. So just, just know, I'm going to give you like the real quick, but it was like, a, it was over months. Um, because the two things I had to do coming in new, I had to understand why are we in this situation? You know, they dropped us, you know, why did we go with them? Help me understand why we're in this situation. That's the first thing. And then two, I got to understand UCLA. What it is, what do we need to help us like be successful? What is it that campus needs? What is it that our student athletes need? And more importantly for me, it was like, I want to win. Like what's going to help us win? I, I, you know, winners win. I want to win. And so I had to learn those two things really quickly. Like what happened here? So you don't make mistakes that you've made before possibly. Uh, and then understand the culture about what it is that we want. So, so it happens. I asked some student athletes, um, because, you know, everything is recruiting and, and development. You recruit talent to any organization. It's recruiting and development. Recruit the best or the best you can get, and then you develop those people in your organization, and hopefully they rise, and it makes your whole organization better, right? Um, if you're a junior, you get better, sophomore, junior, senior year. So um, I had to understand, like, what's important from a, from a high school student, like, What's hot? I don't know what's hot, what's hot, right? What's, what's attractive? What do people wanna be a part of? And so, and then I talked to student athletes, I talked to some coaches, and then I talked to some alums. And, um, you know, to your point about, we've been through so many different uh, companies, like that's something Bill Walton shared with me. And, and he was like, you know, there's only one, there's only one Martin that we need, you know, and he, and he was funny, right? Like. But I talked to um, Kevin Love, man. Kevin Love was huge. He helped me understand, like, Martin, grassroots basketball, it's Nike, man. It's Nike. Like, it's not, like, it, it holds us back when we're not with the best. Like, when we are elite and we're trying to, like, you know, recruit at this level and do these things, some of the best um, talent, when they've been playing in Nikes their whole life and now you want to put them in something else, like, that's not going to be the sole decision, but that, that makes it a little harder to choose Westwood and UCLA. So I want to make it easier to choose UCLA, right? I don't want to make it harder. So anyway, so I get all that feedback and then I, and I talk to people internally, like, you know, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And, and the reality is we had the largest apparel contract in the country. We were getting a lot of money and a lot of product. I mean, that's, that's the deal, you know? And so 
I can't fault anybody for, for doing that, right? Um, but it didn't work. It didn't work ultimately because they, you know, uh, anyway. So, um, so I talked to a lot of people and, and then, um, you know, it was it was one of those things. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the things that you guys would really want to know. Like there were moments where, oh, I'll give you a prime example. So we could have gone with another company. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, we're not getting as much, nearly as much cash as we got in our last deal. We could have gone with other companies that were going to give us a lot more cash. So I had to talk, and this is where I credit Gene Block, our chancellor. You know, and, and, and I'm just going to use general numbers. Just say, for example, you're getting. Five million dollars a year, and all of a sudden you're getting one million dollars a year. But you could go somewhere else and get six or seven or eight. Right. The chancellor and everybody's hurting financially. The chancellor could have told me, "Nah, bro, you need to get the best finance." But he trusted me. I said, "I said, I think I know what's going to help us ultimately be more successful, short term and long term. But it's not going to look like how these other deals have looked. That's just the reality." You know, it's a pandemic, everybody's level setting, everybody knows we're out there, you know what I'm saying? Emperor with no clothes on, everybody knows we're exposed, you know, we don't have leverage right now. So um, so I'm so thankful that he was like, Martin, do what's best for the athletic program in your mind and your opinion. And so that gave me some wiggle room to, to, to say, look, um, I'm gonna sacrifice the short term for the long term vision of what I think we need to do and what we need to be and create an energy and, and, and be with the best, but create an energy and a buzz about UCLA, right? And so, so you start talking to companies and they're all, they're all UCLA was attractive, but then um, you, you, know, you, you learn some things that maybe um, you don't wanna face, but you have to. You know, um, for those companies, for example, one of the biggest metrics is they look at postseason basketball and football success. They have measurements because that's eyeballs, whether it's the NCAA March Madness or whether it's um, a New Year's Six Bowl game or whatever. Well, if you look at us, we have not done that recently. So that doesn't make us as attractive as we may think we are because they, it's money. This is a business to them, you know? And so I had to creatively sell. Again, what am I selling? I'm selling winning or hope. Westwood, number one public school, energy. A lot of room to go like this, you know, like you have to sell that and say, be a part of this. And then you're in this social justice environment. You talk about social justice and the Jordan brand just gave $50 million um, to social justice initiatives. You talk about social justice and you say, LA, like, this is where it's at. You want to be with us, listen at what we can do together. So I had to kind of sell that a little bit. Um, and I don't want to overstate that UCLA is UCLA, but I will tell you some of the metrics they use business wise we, our fans probably think we're, we're this and we're not this to them. That's, that's the deal. So you have to come creative about the partnership. How is it a win for them? How's it went for us? And the other interesting thing is that there became a point with Nike where I was kind of locked in on Nike, but I was like, we're not, I don't want to do it if we're not going to be Jordan brand because Jordan brand is going to differentiate us. There's only four of the schools in the country to do that. No one West of, of, of Oklahoma, like, that no Pac-12, like, again, I'm thinking about how do I differentiate so we can recruit and retain and develop the best? You got to be different. And so I told him, like, I don't know if this is going to work if we're not Jordan brand as well. And Nike came back and said, look, it can be this. If it's not Jordan, I don't know. You know, they couldn't get a hold of Michael for a while. Like, he was golfing and stuff because of everything. You know, he's the final sign off. Michael is. And because it's an investment from the Jordan brand company. And I remember that phone conversation where they were like, you know, we don't know if we can do Jordan. We, we, we want you, but we don't know. And I just said, and, th and this is where you got to believe in yourself. This is, that's another big one that I will tell everybody, believe in yourself. You got to have an inner belief and be willing to put it on the line. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You'll pick yourself up, but you got to believe. And I remember I said um, to this, to the two people, um, on a Zoom, I just said, listen, I want this to happen, but if we're not Jordan Brand, I don't think I can go to my chancellor and, and, and say no to these other companies that are gonna give us a lot more money and stuff that you guys are gonna give us. I gotta have it. And I think we're worth it. 
let's, you know, and I just put it out there. I, 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 I kind of said, if it's not JP, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know. Reality, maybe I still would have done it, but you, you, you know, you, you got to play that chip when you can. Right. And, and you got to, you got to believe in it, man. And, and that's, that was the moment that was like scary for me. Sometimes you got to step out on faith. Like I felt like they wanted to do it. We wanted to do it. Can we get there? Can we get there? Gotta be Jordan though. And they're like, ah, oh. and I'm like, no, 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 no. This is going to be beautiful. You gotta, we gotta do this the right way. This is the way for UCLA or I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, you know? And they came back to me a week later and were like, all right, we got you. Now let's, let's get into the nitty gritty of, you know, what it looks like, what's important. And, you know, and they asked me that and I said, you know, um, product innovation, I want to be with the best. I want our student athletes to be in the best. And, um, and that kind of, and then I wanted a shorter deal. You know, normally deals are 10 to 12 years. Well, like I said, we have no leverage right now. We're on an island. We're in a lawsuit. Uh, don't know what revenues are going to be. So I said, hey, the Olympics is in 2028. I'd love a shorter term deal. And uh, to be able to come back to market when we're better, quite frankly, when we're better, when we're better positioned and we're not in a position of need. We're in need right now because we got dropped. So we did, we worked on six years and that was a big win because that's going to allow us to, Hopefully it's a great partnership and we re-up with them, but, but, you know, circumstances will be a little different then. And, um, you know, so anyway, I don't know if I answered that. Those are just some of the highlights. Yeah, no, no, that's awesome. That definitely answers the question. Um, I'm only salty because it's my last year, so I won't be able to see any of it. <laughs> we'll get um, you some gear. You know what I'm saying? We'll get you some gear next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let me, let me toss it out to the crowd. I see a few hands up first. I'm going to call on Colin. I saw his hand up first. He's uh, not only the vice president here at Biz, but also a student athlete. So Colin, go ahead. Yes. Thanks, Christina. I appreciate it. And Martin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate your time and all that and the wisdom you're sharing with us. It's really cool kind of getting to learn like the intricacies of what it's like being an athletic director and all that. And so in building on that, like, I only got about, a blazer on. You all dressed up, man. I feel underdressed, bro. Just try to keep it professional. On, just try to keep it professional. I appreciate it. You're looking good too, though. Uh, <laughs> I was just uh, thinking in thinking about setbacks on like a more personal level. Would you say that you've had any like failures or setbacks during your career that turned out to actually be instrumental in getting you to where you're at today? That led to like personal growth. And if so, would you consider yourself grateful for it? Yes. And I, you know what? I'm going to tell you an example. Um, and I'm going to share something with you that I haven't shared with many because, you know, you just we're not together every day. and You're not as connected. So I had a conversation with um, a staff person in the athletics department uh, earlier this week. Um, and we were talking about things. And, and then, um, you know, the person made a comment that, you know, not all of us have had it as easy as you've had it being an athletic getting to be, getting an athletic director job at such an early age and and um getting it and and it, I understood what the person was saying was like you got the the Boston College job and that was like your first time and you like hit it and I said I said man and this was my response it was like no, 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 no. You're seeing the iceberg above the water. You're seeing the tip. You're not seeing everything below. I said, yeah, I became the youngest AD of a power five at 37. But what you don't know is I interviewed nine times and got smacked nine times and told no before the 10th, before Boston College was the 10th. People don't know that. It doesn't, it, it's a grind. After I interviewed for, for so many jobs, after the third no of, a, of an AD interview, I thought I was crap. I, I really went to Ohio State going to work every day like, like, man, am I the worst employee in this joint? Like, I can't get a job, I can't get this. I was like, I was down on myself. And, you, and that's what happens. When you get setbacks, you have self-doubt creeps in. And, and again, here you would never think that I didn't have confidence or I didn't think that I was talented. Man, I thought after the third or fourth one, I was horrible. Why am I not getting this job? Why can't I get a job? Why do I keep hearing no's? I heard nine times, no, 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 no. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not. And then finally the 10th one, we'll take a chance on you. So, so I will tell you, because you guys are going to go in the workforce, you're going to get some no's. But the people you see, 
you think it, they haven't, man, we all go through it. And sometimes you got to hang on, man. You got to have grit. You got to see it through. That's why I say see it through a lot. You got to see it through. If I would have stopped after number five or number six and say, you know what, I'll be a good number two or I'll be this. I, I thought about that. I can remember coming home after one, I'm telling my wife, like, you know what, we're good. Just me doing this. You do that. Like, because I'm like, I don't want to get no again. I don't want to keep getting smacked. And then it's just like something inside of you has got to say, nah, man, like you got to believe in yourself. You got to just see it through. You got to just hang on. So, so Colin, that's, that's the setback I want to share with you. Cause that I just talked about it to the staffer. I said, man, I interviewed nine times before this one. He was like, really? It's like, bro, I didn't get it on my first time. You know what I'm saying? That didn't, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, don't let the glossy bio and, and the, and the smooth taste fool you, man. Don't, don't let the, don't let the, the, the shiny cars fool you. No, it's a grind. The grind is real. It'll eat you up. I'm going to persevere, though. I'm going to see it through. Thank you for sharing that with us. I would have never thought that, and that resiliency is truly impressive and honestly, like, really inspirational. So thank you. And, and I take names for all of them that said no. When I get that no, oh, oh, Martin, oh, Martin, oh, Martin, oh. Remember that up here. You. There you go. Yeah, I got you. thank you. <laughs> Back to Christina. Yeah, no, Martin, thank you so much for sharing that because I, I don't think people talk about their failures enough. You know, you see it just from what it is on the outside. You know, you see now that we have the the Jordan deal, you see you at UCLA with the photo shoots and all these things, but what did it really take to get there? And, and you definitely can't undermine that. You know, you have to really, like you said, see it through on your own individual. Yeah, Never assume anyone else just got it, you know? So thank you for sharing that. And I see Chris, you have your hand up. So I'll, I'll pass it out to you uh, for the next question. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garmans, for coming through. Appreciate your time. Um, I recently read something in um, the Higher Ed um, article, and it was about presidents and ADs being under pressure. Um, it says, it's an, you all are under harsh, strict criticism since uh, the wake of 2020 with the three Ps, pandemic, protests, and politics. Um, how do you ensure the direction of the athletic department guiding principles um, continue to continue to be at the forefront and held in its place during these, this time. Keep the focus on the students. First and foremost, that's the focus. I run, I think about the student athletes that we serve and everybody in our department has to align with that. That, that That's a non-negotiable for me. That doesn't mean the student athletes are gonna get everything, but we're gonna try to do everything we can that they have the tools to compete and be their best, be their best. Whatever, whatever Christina's best is, that's what we're going to try to get. You know, um, whatever Bo's best is, that's what we're going to try to get. And, and so that's, that's the first thing. And then I, I think the next thing is you focus on the things you can control, because if you start thinking about all the problems, those three P's, it comes heavy, man. It becomes like, I can't have this energy. If I worried about all day, I had an hour conversation about the budget today that drained everything from me. Cause I'm like, how the hell are we going to fix this? How are we going to do this? I don't know right now. I don't know, but I had to let it go because you know what? I got the rest of the day that I got to be having energy and be positive. You can't let that stuff weigh you down and, and keep you down. Is it hard? Absolutely. Do we have to be creative? Absolutely. A lot in our world, we don't know what's going to happen. In the next 18 months, college athletics is going to look totally different, in my opinion. You got name, image, and likeness. You got, you got court cases. You got transfers one time. Like You got so much that is going to change college athletics. So what I think about is when the dust settles and the smoke clears, how, what, do, what can I do? What can we do? to ensure that UCLA is a leader in this space, regardless of what it looks like. And that's what I focus on. And I can't worry about the politics. You don't like me. I, my hair is too much for you. Um, I'm not proper enough. I don't have my, my, my blazer like Colin's got, you know what I'm saying, Colin? There was a time where I used to do everything thinking this is what people want. And now it's like, no man, be yourself. I'm not, you know who, who is the best at being themselves? Me, <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to be me. I'm going to do me. And, and how do you do that? You just make sure your goals and values are the same. A great education, a great experience for students, 
Uh, I want to I want to make sure our athletic department is an environment that people can grow and develop and learn and want to be a part of and have energy and let's laugh. Let's have fun. Those are the things that are important to me. Mind right, game right. See it through. Love that. Um, and we got going off of that. Actually, there's there's two alumni questions in the chat that are very, very similar. So I'm, I'm just going to read them out from um, Jerry Flintoff and then also Linnea. Um, and so similar questions. They want to ask you about what is your approach to coaching the coaches, um, mm -hmm. especially, you know, coaches that are older than you, especially you being an AD at, at such a young age, even at Boston. So how did you approach that? How did you get other coaches to open up to you, you know, with your young age too? And mm -hmm. how do you also continue to develop, to develop athletes through that way? So I will tell you, first, I'm a lifelong learner. I don't have all the answers. So I try to come into a conversation uh, with a curious mindset and, and understanding I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers. So when you approach people that way, um, it's, it's disarming and, and it allows for communication that's not uh, filtered as much. What do, okay, what does that mean? That's a lot. What does that mean? So what that means is everything we do is about people. You win with people. This is a people business. Everything is about people. How do I relate? How do we connect? So what I try to do is with my coaches, I try to learn about them, but I try to learn what works best for them. And then also, what is the best method for me to challenge or question something and, and to try to help them get better? So, so for example, um, if we lose a game, uh, and I, I don't want to use names because we got student athletes in here, but let's just say we lose a game. I might be pissed off. And I want to ask the coach that night, like, why the hell did you do that? I can't do that. But what I can do is take a day, reflect, pause. I like to pause. And when I talk to that coach and say, you know what, help me understand philosophically how you see this. And then they say, well, this is how I see this. So help me understand how do you, how do you make that decision or that determination? And again, I'm coming at it from a curious standpoint because, because what happens a lot of time, I think I, I, I think this and they share a perspective that I'm like, hmm, I didn't think about it that way. And that happens a lot. And then there's sometimes where it happens and I say, you know what, which I, which I had a conversation with a coach last week, we ain't gonna do that because that goes against, in my opinion, what our values are and what we're about. We ain't gonna do that. You want to you want to bring this person in? Nah, because I've heard this about this person. I don't want to take the risk. It's not worth it. We're UCLA. We ain't got to do that. And I literally told a coach. So you got to know when you when you want to like assert or insert yourself. But you also got to know like these coaches. This is their livelihood. You got to let them make decisions. They got to live with it, not me. So you so they, so there's a level of autonomy that you got to let them have, right? Um, I'll, I'll give a, I'll give another example, Mick Cronin, you know, Mick, I was a student athlete and we played Cincinnati in the NCAA tournament. He was an assistant coach on the Cincinnati staff. My first call to him when I got the job, he was like, man, I got the scout report on you. We played you, blah, blah. That's how big, that's how big hit me. Right. So, so I'm good with Mick, you know, and I'm a basketball guy. So it's even harder sometimes because I see things and I'm like, okay, why is that happening? Or why, you know? And so when I talk to Vic though, I know that he's the expert. I know that he knows way more about basketball than me. And so I try to look at things in a way that's like, what can I do or say to him that's gonna help him, right? Um, that's that's kind of how I approach it, you know? And um, and sometimes it's stuff that that's hard, you know? Like some of our, and, and these other coaches will see this, it's hard for coaches to wear a mask right now. So I've had conversations with coaches like, I know it's a pain, you gotta pull it up. Like you got, you just gotta, you just gotta do it. And that's hard because sometimes you, you know, you're in the heat of the moment. You want to make sure people hear you and all that, but it's, it's very visible. So if you're the volleyball coach and you, you know, you're not wearing it, people see that and that matters. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I come at it from a humanistic approach, meaning I try to learn what's, what's the best approach with my coaches. And then I assume they are the experts. I'm, I'm not even in a basketball or something I think I know. And I come from it like a, a, curio a curiosity. And, and I tell them and I say, look, you know, here's the deal. You, you're the expert, you're the coach. Um, 
this is what I observed. This is what I saw. Help me understand. Is that is that kind of how it was? It was like, oh no, this is what happened, or whatever. That's a good question, by the way. No, that, that's super helpful to your answer because I think a lot of students too on this call, I mean, we all have to work with people and especially, you know, getting into the workforce, you're working with a lot of people who are older than you too. And so navigating those relationships are, are super important. Uh, imposter syndrome, all of these things, you know, where uh, I think age sometimes plays that factor of intimidation and all these different things. So you kind of exuding that confidence also showing where you're coming from too in your communication is definitely something we can all learn from. Let me add this to Christina. The other piece, age doesn't matter to a coach if they think that you have their back and you're, you're trying to go to bat for them. That's another important thing. You've got to show that I've got your back, that I'm going to get in the foxhole with you. That's real. And that's, that's for all of you. Like you have to show your coworkers, your colleagues, your classmates, like I'm going to get in there with you, you know, and, and, and that age don't matter when it comes to that. They want somebody that's got their back. It's hard being a coach. You got a lot of pressure. You, you don't want to guess where, where somebody is. You want to know, like, I got you. I may disagree with you, but coming out of this room, I got you. You, you know, you got to let them know you got their back until you can't, you know, and there might be a situation where you can't. And, you know, it is what it is. It looks like we have we have two more questions. Um, if that's all right, one question in the that's chat. That's all right. We're rolling now. Now, if my okay. kid or or something comes in, and you know, then I gotta, I gotta deuces. What do you say, deuces? Do you still do that, deuces or no? I I think that's just you. But we can go ahead. Oh, I'm out of touch. I'm out of touch. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. Um, so just question in the chat, and then I'll head it over to you too, Bo. So. Alex um, said, he said, hi, Martin, thanks for coming. I'm focused on sports analytics. So he wants to go into that. And he wants to ask about your experience with analytics through your work at OSU, MSU, and Boston College. Have you taken note of also how analytics have evolved over time? So how has that played for you? Yes, I would tell you, is this Alex that asked the question? Mm -hmm. Alex is a great field to go into. Uh, analytics, I think at the college level is highly underutilized. I think this really important with where we're going because I think data and technology gives you an advantage, a competitive advantage, but a lot of colleges are slow moving. They don't know how to use it. So that's the, that's the biggest challenge I saw like at Boston college. I actually met with a couple of MBA students, two in particular that were going to help me understand like what matters to get people to come to football games, for example, you know, and using data. But what we, where, where the roadblock was is, okay, I, we collect all this data. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Everybody's got a full-time job. Like, what? Are, how do you execute? And that's the part that college athletics, in my opinion, has not figured out. So I'm a big numbers analytics guy. I love it. I'm money ball, like absolutely. Like competitive advantage, use it. We got to figure out how to use it though. You know what I mean? Because we're all, everybody, how do you best use it? Um, to benefit like that's that's really what 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 the deal is at least in my opinion when it comes to the college space and analytics huge upside huge growth opportunity yeah it looks like alex you might be able to add value to this space for sure email me alex m jarman at athletics.ucla.edu anybody with the analytics is, that can help us i can't pay you that much i can't pay you <laughs> but you can help us Okay, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Bo for looks like the last question. Go ahead, Bo. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hey, Martin, I just had a question. Uh, I was kind of building off of, you know, you talked about your your um, you know interview process coming up, and you know having all those failures of of coming in and failing nine times and coming back. Um, you know, now that you're kind of more in an established position in your career, you know, you're still very early on, but kind of have an, a, a better perspective now of, of what to do right and what to do wrong. Um, at what point do you think you realized, you know, this is what I have to do to be a successful AD or, you know, this is how I sell myself or, um, you know, in your mind, what position do you take when you get go into an interview or go into a, a big, uh, you know, boardroom in front of, you know, the Jordan brand or whatever, and, and how do you sell yourself? And I think my perspective, I think you, you're great with connecting with people and that's your gift. Um, from my perspective, but what do you think and, and how do you implement your skills and, and, and show that to other people? Great question. Wow. Unbelievable question. I, I too both think a strength of mine is connection. I think I can connect with, with different type, type of people. 
Um, I, I think that's a gift. You should focus on your strengths and less on your weaknesses. I will tell you in the interview processes over time, I was, I was doing a lot of interviews, Bo, trying to be who I thought they wanted me to be. Okay, I'm gonna talk about, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I interviewed at the University of Houston. At the time I had heard they were all about trying to get in a Power Five conference. So I went into that interview thinking, okay, um, to maybe have a chance at the Big 12 or, or Pac-12 or this, and again, not lie and try to sell, oversell, but like in my mind, I was focused on um, how do I show them that, that, that I can maybe be the guy to help them get to a bigger conference. When in reality, Bo, I should have gone in and showed them who I am. I should have talked more about what drives me, what motivates me, because that's what they want. They, they don't want an idea. They want the person. They want to understand you. Is this somebody I want to, and this is another thing. Is this somebody I want to work with every day? Is this somebody I'm going to like seeing every day? You know, I, I say grab a beer test. That's, that's real in the job force. Is this a person that I can see myself after work wanting to grab a beer with? If the answer is no about you, you got to change. You got to be a person that somebody wants to grab a beer with. Because work is hard. It's long hours. Um, so, so to that point, Bo, the, the, the sooner... It took me a while to get comfortable with who I am. And that is the thing that you've got to do. You've got to get comfortable or more comfortable with who you are, what your strengths are, and acknowledge that. And that's really important. I'll give you another example. I, uh, I interviewed, I'm not going to say the place, but I interviewed at a place down south, um, deep south. And, um, and again, this was, this was in 2016. So this was like a year before I finally got my first AD job. So this is probably like number, number eight, right? And it's in the deep South, very racial, you know, charge segregation, you know, all that stuff, right? Long story short, I did that interview and, you know, I interviewed, everybody I interviewed with was white. Um, I have a, a, a white wife. Do you know that in two days that I interviewed with this institution, it never came up about me being a black man and my wife being white. Now, I never brought it up. And I was trying to be the, the black guy that could be a certain way and, and, and not talk about race and not talk about this and because uh, I felt like that might make them uncomfortable. And like, Bo, afterwards, and this was like weeks later, I didn't get it. And I reflected, I'm like, how the hell did I do an interview and not talk about that? Not say, hey, what's the climate like for interracial couples here? What is the, wh why didn't I do that? That's, that's, that's a part of me. How did I not talk about that? So I had to learn, you know, and, and, so, and so what, you know how that helps me, Bill? So the next one, when it was Boston College, the first thing I said was, everything in my life I've earned, nothing's been given. I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't grow up Catholic. I grew up Southern Baptist. I'm not going to church right now. I don't know how I feel about it, but that's the real. If you want me to be some Catholic, you want me to be something, that ain't me. And they love that. Like they told me later, they love that authenticity. But it took time, Bo, for me to get comfortable enough to just be real and just be yourself. Because you're trying so hard to be what your coach wants you to be or what your teacher wants you to be or what your friend wants you to be. Be you. Be you. You're the best you. You're not your best unless you're you. So you gotta find that. You gotta, you gotta remember that, right? And um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. It took me time, but, um, and then what I look for in interviews as you all will interview, energy, energy. When you walk in the room, when you start, is this somebody I wanna have a beer with? Is this somebody that's got good energy? Am I gonna like to laugh at this, like with this person? Energy is big for me. That's, that's like the biggest thing. Like when you walk in a room, do you bring it up or do you bring it down? That's a real easy test. When you walk, because you could be quiet and still have good energy, positive energy. You know, your coach, Bill, Chip Kelly's not, not a rah-rah. He's not going to walk in a room, but he's got good energy. You know, um, so, so what kind of energy you got? What, what you bring into the table? That's something I look at. And then passion. There's no substitute for passion. Whatever is hard works hard, life's hard, I got kids, I got this, I got that, I got stress, I got parents. Huh? You gotta be passionate about what it is. If you're not passionate, I can't get with you. I can't roll with you. 
because it's too hard not to have passion. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just too hard. This is too hard. Do something else. It's okay. But if you want to be elite, you want to be great, shit's hard. See it through. Hang on. Be yourself. Like, and you're going to fall and you're going to get smacked. I, I don't make the best decisions all the time, but I try to make a, a, a bad one once. You know, it's just like playing. I try to do it once. Yep. I try to learn from it. You know, I, I'll give you an example. My boss is Gene Block. For a while, when we were the number one institution. We still are, but I had the backdrop where it said like number one public institution. I hope he doesn't mind me telling the story, but it's but it's good. So we did a Pac-12 conference with the with the chancellors and the ads and all all these people, and I had that as my background on the Zoom. Number one, you know, and my one-on-one -on -one with him, and this was the first time he kind of like done this. He said, "Hey, Martin, I just want to tell you, you know, having that background with with everybody in the Pac-12 and all, I don't know if that's like the the best thing you want to do just we don't know how it how it might make people feel and i love that and i was like boss that makes sense i am sorry it won't happen again thank you for telling me giving me that feedback i need that i want to get better you know and i wanted to praise him almost because like i want him to be comfortable to tell me like no nah, bro what you doing right. <laughs> like yeah you know so 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 be candid with each other be candid and, and don't worry about that feedback young people sometimes you get all when it's negative feedback, negative feedback's good because you get better. And then immediately I got from university, hey, give me a background without the number one and all that, <laughs> you know, and we ready to roll. But then I also want to show him I can accept the coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a finished product. I want to get better too, right? So hopefully it's easy for him to share feedback or, you know, the next time. I went way long on that one, sorry, but. No, that was awesome. Thank you, appreciate that. It looks like we got one more question we can squeeze out of you if that's all okay. right. Yes. Uh, Revan, and let me know if I'm saying it, please correct me if I'm saying your, your name wrong, but go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Christina. Hi, hi, Martin, I'm Ravant. I'm a senior at UCLA now. Um, first Ravant. One, yeah, first wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. I'd say I can speak for myself and I think all my classmates, everyone who came here is a really informative talk and really got to get to know you really well. And I think we're all really excited to see where the athletic department goes in the next few years. Um, my question was a little, little kind of related to, I, I know you mentioned briefly talking about how college athletics will change with likeness and, um, and kind of uh, rights to players' names and all, and all that kind of changing the next like few years or so. So I kind of wanted to ask you, so with NCAA uh, football kind of coming back into video games soon, if they did a Legends version of that game, which UCLA player should be on the cover? Would it be Aikman? Would it be MJD? Anyone different? You know what? I'm going to say Gary Beban. I'm going to say Gary Beban. You're talking about football. You're talking about a football game, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they, re -announced, they announced the game is coming back this year, the football game. I'm going to say Gary Beban. I just talked to Gary the other day. He, he's our Heisman Trophy winner in either 66 or 67. Great dude. Loves UCLA. I'm gonna I'm go with Gary. He talked to me about he wants those light the the light blue uniforms back. Gary <laughs> Gary's funny. He was giving me some advice. I'm like Gary, man, come on, man. I just got here. Give me a break, man. <laughs> yeah, that's a great game. That's hilarious. That's funny. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for all of this. Um, and so before I close out, I'll, I'll open it up back to you, Martin. If you have anything else, you know, you wanna share with the students, um, any last words of encouragement, anything else, and, and then I'll wrap us up for the night. Yeah, two, uh, you guys know, I mean, I'm, I, I think you've got to have a curious mindset. You've got to be, um, I think, a lifelong learner, always wanting to learn. I want to get better. So I will ask everybody, if you have thoughts about how our athletics program can, can, uh, can attract more students or young alumni to events, I'm all ears. I think we need we need more student engagement with our programs. So if you have ideas, this is your homework. Is this is the email them to me? Um, M Jarman at Athletics. I can put it. I can write it in the chat if you don't close it down. Excuse me. But I'd love to hear from you if you have thoughts. Um, that's something that that is really important to me. I just I just want our student our student body to support our student athletes more. You know, um, at a place like this. So that's homework. And then um, the only other thing, um, you know, I hope I hit a lot of what you what you wanted. Um, you know, I know that uh, this is a crazy time for a lot of you, all of you, 
you know, it's a, it's a strange time. Just know this too shall pass. Don't get caught up in thinking this is forever. This is not forever. Um, and so I want you to think about, you know, how do you come out of this better? You know, let's, we've all been talking about how negative, how hard this is. How are we getting better? How are you gonna come out of this more focused, more determined, uh, more passionate about what it is you're chasing? Everybody's chasing something. Everybody's chasing something. What are you chasing? And, and how are you gonna go get it? And, and how do you cultivate that passion, that energy, that drive that you need to get it? You know, whether that's a grade, whether that's a class, whether that's a job, whatever it is, lock in. You know, that's, that's what I would say, lock in. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for everything you shared too. I know Tori put your email too in the chat. We have a, a decent amount of alumni on the call, a decent amount of young alumni, former athletes. So definitely, you we know. We need you young alumni. We need you to come back to games, man. Come back to events and competitions. We need it. And we're all excited once we once we can all come back, once COVID is done and, and all of that as well. Um, so just finally to wrap up, um i'm just gonna just announce too so thank you everyone for coming uh, for this and i hope you guys learned a lot once again feel free to always you know reach out to us via instagram or email or via our website and just let us know what you guys thought about uh, about this event i know i learned a lot so we'd love to hear your feedback just talking about next week or our next play we have a, a meeting at this exact same time wednesday february 10th 6 p.m we have shara lynn aguiar coming in she is a UCLA alumni. She's also the current vice president and also corporate strategy and office of the chairman at ESPN. Previously worked at Disney, ABC, YouTube, and Fox Sports. So that's what's happening next week. And just once again, uh, I'm going to pass it out to Johnny real quick, and, and then we'll, we'll let you guys all go. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm Johnny. I am the BSBA treasurer. Um, and I am very excited to announce that we are having a t-shirt giveaway for uh, the person who is closest to predicting the final score of the Super Bowl. Um, I have got our BSBA t-shirt on tonight. Um, we have an example up here on the slides as well. And um, if you just go to the link that Colin just dropped in the chat, predict the Super Bowl score as accurately as you can um, before Saturday at midnight, and you can win a BSBA t-shirt to rep our brand yourself. Um, if you can't participate in the giveaway or you would just want to make sure that you're supporting the club and guarantee that you're getting a t-shirt, um, you can also order now on our website uh, 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 and uh, we'll drop that link in the chat as well. Um, thank you guys for coming out again and I'll pass it back to Christina. Awesome. Thank you so much, Johnny, for that. Um, and once again, check the links in the chat for the attendance policy, but just everyone give a round of applause. Thank you so, so, so much, Martin, for, for showing up today and dropping all that wisdom. We really appreciate your time. We know you're super busy with everything happening uh, with all your, in, within your job, within COVID, uh, within this virtual space with your one-year-old, all of that. So we really, really appreciate your time here um, and thank you. And 